office hours. We're going to give it a few minutes for folks to arrive. Uh, looks like we already have a few people present. Uh, I see uh, Karen, Scott, and Garanga. Welcome, guys. Glad you could be here. We'll give it just a couple of more minutes before uh, before we dive into it. So, news of the day: uh, Elon Musk now owns Twitter. Uh, I find that fascinating for a lot of different reasons. Um, does this really have to do with data? Yeah, I guess so, a certain to a certain degree. But I, I just find the whole situation and the, kind of the whole debate around um, kind of Twitter, uh, I find it rather fascinating because I'm a bit of a dinosaur, in case you couldn't tell by all the gray hair. Um, I worked for a little uh, online startup called uh, called AOL for a decade from 1995 to 2005. So I was kind of at ground zero for the beginning of the internet. Uh, it's, it's certainly the commercialization of the internet and was there at the beginning of Twitter and know lots of people that were involved in that company and others that are kind of well known. And um, I find the kind of some of the debate around Twitter uh, of, of uh, related to free speech r rather quizzical. I, I find that uh, odd. Uh, to say the least, because um, free speech is is what you would expect if you walked out in a, a public park, right, or onto your street or some other public area, and you and you and you, you know you started to to yell at the top of your voice. But Twitter costs millions, if not billions, uh, of dollars to create and 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 manage and run, and the servers and the infrastructure and the people and. And there's certainly nothing free about, about that. So I, I don't understand why people think they have a right to free speech on, on a private company's infrastructure, um, which, which, which is interesting. And then there's a regulatory aspect to it as well and how, how companies like Twitter are regulated. Probably a separate question altogether. Um, way, 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 way back in the day, there were a lot of debates around how do we regulate the internet, right? The FCC got involved and other government agencies were talking about getting involved and what they decided was to basically treat the internet as what's called a common carrier, like a, like the telephone lines, where <clears throat> if somebody says something horrible on, on the telephone, um, you know they're they're not necessarily respond. The, the the telephone companies weren't responsible for for the horrible words uh, that people were saying uh, on the phone lines, and largely kind of internet companies have been regulated that way, including including Twitter, uh, kind of largely viewed as a common carrier. But then again, they went ahead and, and imposed a lot of, of limitations on what you could say on Twitter, and rightfully so, because they're an advertiser-supported business. So they overlaid this odd business model on top of a, an old regulatory framework that was largely based on how telephone companies work, and the combination of the two were just, just a bad mix. So it's interesting to see what Elon will do with, uh, with, with Twitter. I'm, I'm going to be watching that. I uh, see a couple. Oh, well, that's Ben. Okay. Hi, Ben. Um, Katarznia, I hope I'm saying that right. Welcome. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can raise your hand over on the right-hand side. Uh, you can drop your question into the Q&A, into the chat. Uh, well, there's Q&A versus chat. If you just want to ask a question in the chat, that's cool too. Uh, you can ask it in the Q&A. Q you can raise your hand and we can actually bring you on the stage so that you would be kind of side by side with me. Uh, however you want to do it. So there's basically kind of three ways to get your questions out there, or maybe you just want to listen and that's cool too. Uh, Garanga, awesome. First question, how can we create a data governance scorecard and what are the parameters do we need to consider? Great question. Well, first and foremost, uh, a data governance scorecard assumes that you've got a data governance program uh, and assumes that you have data governance policies and procedures in place. So I'm going to assume that you do, or a company does, right? For a lot, that's a huge, huge challenge, <laughs> establishing governance and establishing the, the policies and procedures, the rules of the road. Like that's, that is a major stumbling block for a lot of companies, but let's just assume that that's, that's, that's a given. Uh, a big part of those governance policies and procedures will be, um, well, I would argue, uh, need to be, um, metrics of success, KPIs. Let's take data quality, for example. Data quality is one aspect of a governance framework. There's security, there's access, there's, there's, there's certainly other uh, aspects of a, of a governance framework, but let's take data quality because that, that's, that's a relatively good use case here to discuss in the context of your question. Uh, how would you create a governance scorecard around data quality? Well, you would have to describe the policies and procedures around data quality first. Then you would have to say, okay, when is something accurate versus inaccurate? When is data fit for purpose and when is data not fit for purpose? 
So having those things defined is going to be critical. How do you define accuracy? How do you even define a customer record versus a supplier record versus any other record? So having the policies in place is, is all of the heavy lifting, is all the hard part, right? We're, we're defining what accuracy means and defining boundaries for accuracy to say, we expect our data quality to be at least 60%. I, I'm talking at a really high level here, obviously, guys. We could go into details about how to define quality in terms of things like accuracy, uniqueness, uh, is the data is the data complete? Is it is it trustworthy? And all the other attributes of, of what defines quality. Each one of those things, each of those quality attributes would need would need to have metrics associated to it, right? So, uniqueness, for example, is is an attribute of data quality. Uh, what are your guidelines for what you are willing to expect ex accept or not accept from a uniqueness perspective, aka duplication? I would argue that aiming for a hundred percent is not reasonable from a data quality perspective across the board it's not reasonable right so what are what are your uh, you know expected values there is is it okay to say well i think 80% uniqueness is okay and we'll accept 20% duplication that that seems extreme maybe but it all traces back to what are your desired business outcomes so if you've attended any previous office hours or even ones into the future i guarantee you this is something i'm going to be talking about your data governance procedures and policies should reflect a desired business outcome, right? So you do data governance, you do data management, you do all these things to drive business outcomes. And an example here could be, oh, well, well, one of the desired outcomes that we have for our customer data is customer satisfaction, right? That, that, that's a cl classic example. And so where I'm going with this, guys, is that you really have kind of have two pillars of metrics here. You have business metrics on one side, Right. What are the expected business outcomes that you want to drive through your data management policies and through your governance policies? Then you also should have some form of data metrics. And those things should actually meet up at, at different levels within the organization. I've tried to do a, a, a diagram here to describe this. Um, let me see if I can share that, if I've got that up. This is, this is most certainly a, a work in progress. Um, I've wrestled with this, frankly, guys, for honestly a couple of years about how to articulate this and how to draw this diagram um, in the most effective way. Um, I don't think this is it. This is still a work in progress. But um, what, what I'm sharing on the screen here is a bit of a triangle. And when it comes to metrics of any sort, um, there's two types. The left-hand side of this diagram would be those business metrics that I was talking about. Start at the top of this pyramid, by the way. So business metrics would be things like, um, you know, what, what are your goals at a company level, right? What are your expected sales for next year? What are your expected operating efficiencies for next year? How many widgets do you expect to produce next year? And on and on. Working your way down the pyramid on the left-hand side as the arrow goes down, you get more and more and more granular on those business KPIs, on those business metrics, where you could get somewhere in the middle where you would say, we expect a customer service rating of, of X percent, or we expect a, a, a production manufacturing productivity number of Y percent. There are literally, guys, thousands of metrics here within a given business that your business would find important. The key thing here is, is that your business finds important, right? Starting from the strategy, going all the way down. You could argue going all the way down from business strategy into specific divisional metrics, into product strategy KPIs, right? How many things do you want to sell? Uh, you know, what's your, what is your cross-sell rate, upsell rate? Again, thousands of potential metrics here. We're not focused on those. You could go all the way down the left-hand side and get down to individual fields of data, product data, customer data, supplier data. The right-hand side of this pyramid is where those data metrics would lift. So left-hand side of the pyramid, business metrics, business KPIs. On the right-hand side, kind of IT-focused metrics, data metrics, data quality metrics. At every level, these things would want, you would want to align these. Meaning, what do you expect what, from the, from, through the lens of customer satisfaction again? What are the data quality metrics that are supporting customer satisfaction and are measures of customer satisfaction? How are those things connected? So. This is a really kind of long-winded way of saying <laughs> from, a, from a governance KPI perspective, um, there's a lot of things to consider. The KPIs you use should be limited. The KPIs that you use from a governance perspective should be a reflection of your data governance policies. Your data governance policies should be a reflection of your desired business outcomes. So you can kind of see a cascade forming here, guys. So 
ultimately all of these things would line up. Business metrics, data quality, IT, data focus metrics, having them line up, having them align to your business strategy, right? That's that's kind of the, the, the nirvana that we're, we're really kind of talking about here. So hopefully that made sense. Uh, so again, with me, Gronga, you should know by now, you, you're never gonna get a really, really short answer here, but make the metrics um, uh, you know, actionable, make sure the metrics are something that the business cares about, make sure that they're tied the data quality metrics are tied to those business metrics that we that I was talking about, um, and make sure that they support that overall data strategy, right? That, that overall business strategy. So that's a long answer to a short question. If you want to get into specific metrics, uh, probably we could take it offline. But I mean, in in any given governance program, um, uh, when talking about like what does a governance framework look like? At Gartner, a governance framework had seven attributes, you know, data quality, MDM, security, access, trust, there's a few other attributes. You could be measuring things across all of those. That's why I'm such a huge believer in trying to be as agile, uh, capital A, uh, agile uh, as possible, especially when you're starting out, right? So instead of trying to define all of your metrics, right, for all of those seven aspects of a governance framework, and Dama or Dama, Dama, D-A-M-A, they've got a great framework here as well, guys. So if you, if you Google Dama data governance framework, they've got a great governance framework. Um, there are a lot of them out there, but, but Dama's is, is pretty good. Um, <clears throat> if you try to, to build metrics and dashboards for all aspects of a governance framework, it, you, you would spend easily a year doing it, probably longer, right? And I've seen this. I was, I was a consultant <laughs> that was making money off of defining governance frameworks where it's like when you kind of peel the onion and you dive into this, there's a lot of there's a lot of dashboarding you could you could be doing here because there's a lot of policies that would be needed to support that entire thing for all data for an entire organization. Can you instead a great kind of MVP approach here, a more agile approach here, is just pick one business outcome. Remember the top of that pyramid, right? One business outcome. Maybe it's better customer satisfaction, right? Pick one that a senior leader really really cares about that your CEO is probably talking about in your company all hands meetings that may be something printed on your, your annual report. This is a top priority for us is increasing your customer satisfaction. I, I don't know if it is or it isn't just kind of throwing it out there. But if you were just starting and you were trying to get up and running from a governance framework perspective and an MDM perspective, right? Governance and if you were looking at MDM and saying, I need to launch an MDM program. How do I do that? How do I do it quickly? And I need to launch the governance that is needed to support MDM. How do I do that quickly? What I would say is focus on one outcome. Notice I'm not saying domain. Do not try to limit scope of an MDM or governance program through the lens of a domain. It will not work. It's a false limitation, right? Because if you start to say, and I've, I've heard this so many times, I, I've lost count, right? When I talk to my clients, well, you know, how are you, how, what, you know, how are you defining the scope of your MDM initiative? Well, it's customer domain. Well, when you look at things through the lens of customer, that's customer data is everywhere. It touches like everything, every system, every table, every application, every business process. And it's really kind of a false limitation, not to mention the fact you really can't measure it. Me meaning, you know, OK, we're going to have better customer data. Well, well, how do you measure that? If you do try to measure it, what you will find is you will find yourself going all the way back to those business processes that I was first talking about. Right. Those are the ones that matter, right, because the business is driven by business process, by business outcomes. And more importantly, your senior executives will get annual bonuses based on those business outcomes. Nobody's getting an annual bonus. Maybe IT leaders are, but, but, but I will glibly say that nobody's getting an annual bonus based off of data quality metrics, unless you happen to be in IT. But most of the people with the big, with the big dollars that are, that are signing off on these programs uh, get annual bonuses based on better business performance, business outcomes. So tie an MDM program and a governance program to like one or two of those outcomes. Increase customer satisfaction, cross-sell, reduce cost of sale, re reduce manufacturing costs, whatever those things are. Then define the governance dashboards and the governance metrics that you would use to measure whether or not you're delivering against that one or two of those one or two outcomes. Is it possible to share the link for any resource related to scorecard for data governance? Um, I don't think I've, if I was still a Gartner, I'd have a whole bunch of, of resources here. I'm not sure I still have a data governance scorecard or, or any sort of KPIs. Um, let me take that as a homework item, Garanga. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think I have anything here because it's it's really tough to apply a one size fits all here. 
Because the right answer, right? Like putting on my consultant hat, the, the right answer here are the KPIs that you want to track are the KPIs that matter to your business. And what matters to one business may not matter to another business, right? I've been using really high level examples here, like customer experience or cross sell or upsell or reduce manufacturing costs or reduce supplier costs. Those are pretty high level examples and ubiquitous. I mean, because everybody's going to want to probably do those things. But when you get into the weeds, individual KPIs and dashboards, uh, those are going to vary significantly by company, by vertical, um, because it, it's just, it's just, it's just how it is, right? Cause everybody's going to have slightly different metrics when you get into the, like the, the nitty gritty and the, the specifics of it. So the metrics for a manufacturing company are going to be totally different than the metrics for a, let's see, a, you know, kind of a B2C, uh, uh, consumer packaged good company. I mean, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be very different. It just, just is. So like coming up with a one size fits all templatized, here's your data governance dashboard, I think would be really, really tough. But I will take a look. I'll take, I'll, I'll do some homework there and see if there are some kind of publicly available examples uh, out there that, that I think are worthwhile. There may be, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I'm looking around. Aha, I got hands. I will. I, I see questions from Katarznia. Um, hey, do you have any ideas on, oh, it's right in the middle of the screen. Do you have any ideas on <laughs> possible effect of using MDM in game industry, meaning multiplayer games, MMO? Uh, I've worked with a lot of, uh, or maybe such, maybe if such connections can be made at all. Yes, well, certainly, yes. The, the short answer is, is yes. Um, I've worked with a lot of gaming companies in the past, uh, generally focused on customer, right? Where that the gaming company is trying to understand like who are all of their players, right? Who who are all all of the customers, um, uh, and, and create kind of master metrics there, and and, and kind of a, a single master record, particularly for large gaming companies that have like multiple brands. I've I've, I've had that conversation. I I can't tell you tell you who I've had the conversation with, but. Imagine an extremely large gaming company that has multiple brands and multiple player experiences where they don't have a single source of truth for any one player experience because they've grown through merger and acquisition. So yes, absolutely. MDM is used widely within the gaming industry to come up with uh, creating kind of single trusted views of player slash customer related data. So yes, absolutely. I know that's a really, really high level answer. But but most certainly relevant if if you have you know Joe Smith Joseph Smith JJ Smith J Smith at gmail.com J Smith at hotmail.com is this one person or is that five different people that's a classic MDM use case and if you're wrestling with that uh, MDM most certainly can, can can help and I suspect for larger kind of game companies um, that's uh, you know a, a, a common um, a common problem. Uh, across game gaming industries, um, beyond customer, I mean, some of the areas where we would look would be like supplier or product. Probably not relevant from a supplier perspective because you're you're probably own coding and developing and engineering your own uh, gaming experiences. Uh, product probably again a little bit less relevant, um, but still could be relevant. You know, if you're looking for a single product master, again, a lot of these bigger game companies have, have got to where they are by by acquiring brands. Um, but I mean, usually in my conversations with gaming uh, companies, it always comes down to like understanding who our players are and having a consistent player experience across brands, loyalty programs across brands, uh, in, by brand, I mean like, you know, gaming brand, uh, Katarzy, I hope that kind of answers the question. We could go into details about how customer MDM works and, and, you know, like why it's deployed. But if you're struggling with a single view of the truth or a 300, like, uh, commonly known as a 360 degree view of who your various um, players slash customers are, MBM can be a great fit. Uh, Hiran, uh, do, do. is there a data modeling methodology for MDM? Great question. Uh, what aspects of data modeling? Uh, sorry, I'm, go I'm going like this. I bought this, this, this little piece of plexi glass, this little piece of plastic that, that, that lowers my webcam. Um, so it's hanging over the ledge of my monitor and it lowers my camera so that I'm, I can make more eye contact, but sometimes it's covering what I'm reading. 
It's not going like this. Let's see what's on the screen. Um, what aspects of data modeling must one adhere to while designing MDM? Fantastic question. Um, so one of the core capabilities of MDM, it, it allows you to create and, and manage and persist multiple models of anything, right? The whole idea about MDM is, in essence, is that you take disparate models that exist within source system, right? It could be CRM, could be an ERP, could be some digital marketing system, doesn't matter. Model A, model B, model C, model D, model E, multiple models, multiple definitions, multiple structures, uh, multiple hierarchies for that data. And then you bring all that data into one place and apply consistent models to it. Now that doesn't necessarily mean one model. You could have multiple models by domain, by division, by department. Uh, you could have as many models in an MDM as you want. I mean, realistically speaking, you know, you're not going to you know, design hundreds of them. Uh, but the whole idea is conceptually, at the very least, to have a single model uh, and single definitions underlying that model uh, to solve for questions like how many customers do we have? How many products do we have? And, and the best way to do that is to have consistent models for those data types. Um, is there a consistent model to do it? Um, well, there are, there, there are some kind of templatized models out there. So all MDM vendors, including Prophecy, but all of the MDM vendors will have kind of canned, for lack of a better word, will predefined data models that you can use um, on, on day one if you want to use them. Kind of the, the a typical approach here, at least from more of a B2B model, but it, it works in a B2C model as well, is more of what, what I would call a party-based model. So instead of let, let's 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 take a B two B use case. Instead of having a table for customer data and supplier data and two separate tables, a, a, a common way to model that data is more of a party, which is it's a business party and it and and where you you know separate out uh, relationship type, right? Where you so separate out relationship type supplier, relationship type customer, relationship types vendor, whatever doesn't matter. Um, that is a kind of, I would argue that's a far more flexible uh, model and, and, and that's kind of a common approach in, in an MDM world. Again, the right answer here with all data models, the right answer here, of course, is what are the business processes that you're kind of trying to model through your data? What does the optimal kind of greenfield business model look like or, or data model look like from the desired outcomes perspective? I would argue generally most of these models are going to look largely the same. The thing to kind of one of the things to avoid here is to avoid the temptation to think that all data is master data. It's not. When you're talking about MDM and master data, you're talking about a significant subset of data. I've worked with like ridiculously large companies where their customer master record was like eight fields of data, right? MDM, master data, is the data that is used widely across the organization and needs consistent governance, needs that consistent model, needs consistent structure, quality, governance policies, all of the above. That generally means that you're talking about a significant subset of data. The, the way that I've, I've ar always articulated this is using a Venn diagram, a three ring Venn diagram, source one, source two, source three, right in the middle of that Venn diagram, that's your master data. And it's going to be a subset. But to the question about how to model it, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, a, a good one that's been around for a long time. Um, each of the vendors kind of have standard approaches here, but, but a good one that, that, that I'm relatively familiar with. Um, there's a decent amount of documentation out there. It's called Oracle's TCA, uh, Oracle's kind of standard model. It's the trading community architecture, kind of as an archetype, um, as a kind of a, a, an example of a party-based data model. I, I think that's a pretty good one. But again, all the MDM vendors will, will, will have kind of templatized models, uh, generally, uh, even by industry, where there's a kind of a model for healthcare or manufacturing or CPG. But most of them, it's just different nouns. It's, it's just different words to describe largely the, the, the same thing. So you don't have to adhere to a specific model. You can start Greenfield. You can model anything you want uh, in an MDM. You can have multiple models. Of course, these things take time. So it's, there's going to be a balancing act here. Ultimately, they're going to be a reflection of your requirements. There are certain models that I've seen used more widely than others. They tend to align to that kind of the notion of a party, party business versus party person. Uh, is kind of typically how um, uh, things are separated out. A lot of flexibility in those models. Um, but yeah, it, 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 the sky's the limit in MDM. That's a good thing. Can be a little bit of a bad thing. I would argue again to start simple. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, do, 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 do. Back to the chat. 
Garanga is back. How do we build a data privacy governance foundation for an organization? Oh my goodness. Wow. That's a big one. <laughs> uh, I fear I will not be able to answer that in what, what do we got? 36 minutes, uh, a data, data privacy governance foundation. And, and I'll be honest, guys, I'm not a privacy expert uh, at all. And, and I, I wouldn't take my guidance from a privacy policy perspective. You should be really talking to a privacy expert, right? So when it comes to acceptable uses of data, when it comes to privacy regulations, HIPAA, CCPA, whatever those are, uh, I'm not your guy. Um, I, I just, it, it's, it's, it's 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 kind of an area that that I don't like to tread in because I know a little, and but but that's but but where it comes to pol individual policies related to, to to privacy, I'm 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 I have an abundance of ignorance there, and I and I don't want to claim that I that I don't. Uh, however, I do know and and can help people and help companies, you know, kind of define governance frameworks as as a whole. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, privacy and security writ large is kind of, I know these are different things, but uh, privacy is one area where a, uh, a data governance organization, which will typically sit under a CIO or CDO, one, one of the two, not exclusively, typically, though, I, I would say easily three quarters of the time under CIO or CDO. Sometimes they live under CFO, sometimes they live under COO, but generally going to be under in an IT function. Uh, privacy is one area from a, from a governance perspective where you need and must have an active collaboration with people within the privacy side of the house and the legal side of the house, right? So when it comes to governance, you know, I always get the question of, well, who owns governance, Right. Who, who, who owns governance? And, and it's a really loaded question because governance is not monolithic. Right. Key thing to keep in mind here is two things. Policy definition, policy execution. Two things. You can have two different parties involved here. So from the perspective of privacy, policy definition, IT people should not be touching that. No. Right. To, to the degree that IT needs to be involved to, to, to ensure that you can meet the requirement, of course, you're going to be involved. But in terms of like driving policies around security or around privacy, that's where your privacy people need to be involved. Right. So the privacy people are going to be the ones that are defining those policies. Policy execution is a different thing. Policy management is a different thing. If you've got the requirement as a governance lead, if you've got the requirements as a, as a data and analytics leader, uh, you can often have the mandate to go and execute and make sure that it happens. And the more automated that is, that is the better, right? You can absolutely have data stewards who live in IT, not optimal, they should live on the business side, but sometimes they do live in IT. You can have data stewards in IT enforcing uh, privacy policies. Most certainly you, you, you can, but they didn't define the policy, right? So this is why the question of who owns data governance is such a, just a, such a loaded question because the business and the IT together own data governance, and there's no one clear owner. This is one area where I do disagree with the, 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 the DAMA framework. So, so, so DAMA, D-A-M-A, um, says that there should be owners, a, a data owners. And honestly, guys, I don't know what that means. Given what I just said, right, that you can have a policy owner, somebody defining the rules, and you can have somebody else enforcing it. Well, who, do, who owns it? What, what does that even mean? Like who owns that data? If I, if I have a chief privacy officer defining the rules for, um, let's let's say a retention, right? Uh, a data retention or, or, or data access, or who can who who can even see a customer record, or who can see a medical record? If I have a chief privacy officer, a chief compliance officer, or chief security or CISO, chief security officer defining data access rights, right? But then I have somebody else over in in maybe even an operating unit, not even just the IT, but maybe somebody who is in an operating unit, maybe not an operating unit, like medically speaking, but like in, 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 a, in an operating you know, group of a company, right? Somebody who is selling something or making something or, or interacting with a customer through a customer service experience, right? Like those people could actually be actively enforcing the business policies of those senior level people. In that, in that world, who owns that? It's not one person. Right. So this is where I, de I, I this is one area where I disagree with Dom is like the data ownership is not absolute in the governance space. So the, the nutshell summary is f you got to have a great relationship with whoever in your organization is, is is responsible for privacy. 
So I would, I would most certainly recommend having some idea of your core business outcomes, right? Like what are the things that you're trying to solve for through the implementation of governance, right? Sometimes when it comes to privacy, the business outcomes are simply risk mitigations, meaning, meaning the, 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 the business outcome is we don't get sued, right? Or, or we don't go to jail or we don't break the law. And, and for privacy and security, that's a valid outcome, right? We're going to mitigate risk. When we think about business outcomes, there are three. Increase revenue, lower cost, mitigate risk, right? And, and privacy and security goes into the mitigate risk. So you need to understand the starting at the top of that pyramid, like what are your kind of your core outcomes from a privacy perspective, right? And, and for privacy and security, I, I would argue just like any other business outcome, your chief privacy officer, your chief security officer is going to have some way to measure when is our privacy su succeeding and when is it not succeeding, right? That's where you start understanding those things and working with those people, working down that pyramid that I was sharing all the way into specific data elements and specific policies all along the way. So it's a big nut to crack. I would not certainly recommend as, as an IT centric person trying to embark on solving for policy for privacy policies and, and implementing privacy policies. I, I would want to have every single one of those signed off by the people responsible for privacy in your organization. So building the relationships, understanding what success looks like, defining the policies through the lens of specific outcomes that are measurable. Those are all great ways to start. You can overlay a governance framework like I was talking about, like the DAMA framework and the other frameworks. Uh, but understanding what success looks like is going to be key. And then limiting your scope is also going to be key as well. Because I would argue for, for relatively a big company, um, defining policies for privacy and, and it could be, could be a months long, uh, endeavor. I, I've, I've sat in those conference rooms, like, like weeks and weeks and weeks and try to figure out, okay, what are our privacy policies look like for everything? Uh, and that's when kind of the, the, the clock can really, really start ticking. Um, because often a lot of companies don't have those things well defined. Uh, which is kind of scary, but uh, true. Uh, you're welcome, Katarzyna. Hopefully I'm saying your name correctly and hopefully I answered your question. Uh, are there any more questions? Just looking back on Hiran's question, I think we got to... Hiran, if, if I missed the mark of the modeling question, uh, let me know in the chat. There's no one size fits all, but... I mean, the whole, the whole, one of the whole, not the whole, but one of the value props of MDM is that it allows you to take a greenfield approach from a modeling perspective and to have one model where you could have 15 within an organization. And that buys you a lot of goodness from a data quality perspective, data consistency, fit for purpose, you name it. Um, I would, speaking of governance and speaking of models, I would argue that it, the data modeling is inherently a governance exercise meaning you can't really build a model until you define your data and define the relationships between, between data types. Now, whether you want to do that via traditional kind of relational database or, or if you want to run graphs to understand the relationships, those are still governance policies, right? Me meaning um, how do I define the relationship between a person and a household? Or how do I define the relationship between a subsidiary and a headquarters in, in a more of a B2B use case? The answers to those questions should be defined through a governance policy. How do I do, how do I define a customer? Right. I, it seems like a simple question, but is it current customers, past customers, people who are paying? What about customers or who are maybe on a free trial, right? Like these are, these are all questions that need to be asked as a part of a data governance initiative. And if you've been tasked to say, okay, well, you know, hey, here and go build us uh, a, a, an MDM model. And some of those questions have not been answered or you lack clarity there, then I would say, you know, hey, push back a little bit because you need more definition there. And I've, I've learned this the hard way. <laughs> Trust me on this one. I have learned this the hard way. So early, early on in my career around MDM and data governance, I was tasked to go fix bad data. You go, go fix that data. I was part of a team, of course, it wasn't just me. Um, but I was kind of the program lead uh, and I was a consultant and we were tasked to go fix the data. And I had very little engagement from the business, 
very, very little engagement from the business and very little money to, to, to get additional resources. And I had a very, very specific deliverable from an SOW perspective. And what I did the first time around is I guessed, right? In building that customer data model, I, I guessed at it. Uh, and I got the guesses wrong. And you don't want to do that because <laughs> because if you have to revisit that data model, that's like, you know, that's that's replacing the wing of a flying plane. Um, so there are some things that really, really matter more than others. And I would argue getting the definitions correct uh, is, is job number one. And that is a really, really tough position to be in and I, as an IT person, as a database administrator, as a data engineer. It's a tough position to be in if you don't have adequate business engagement, because ultimately it needs to be the business that is defining who is a customer, who is a supplier, what's a product, what's a location, right? We were looking, we were talking about the example of, of the gaming industry before, right? How, what's even the words that you use to describe it? Do you describe it as a player or as a, as a customer? I, I, I don't know, but even those things need to be defined by the business, because if you don't, what could happen is, is that you could invest a lot of time in governance and MDM. You may even deploy something. You could push something to production. Uh, and this is what I did is I, I built an analytical MDM using a customer model that had just a lot of assumptions. Uh, um, it was ba basically anybody who's ever given us money. Like th that was it. That, <laughs> that, that, that was the customer model. Anybody who's ever given us money. I was like, okay, this probably should work. Uh, and I deployed an MDM using that. And then I started to produce some reports and the business shredded those reports to bits. Like this isn't a customer. That's not a customer. This isn't a customer. What, what were you thinking here? Uh, so that was uh, like MDM failure number one for me of, of multiple MDM failures. So <laughs> I commit this through the school of hard knocks. I've learned what you do and what you don't do. Uh, answered. Great. Awesome. Um, to move a camera what is the purpose or difference of operational mdm and analytics mdm ah great question um it's pretty simple right so um if if i were to draw it out uh on a powerpoint oh, man i could make could i do that real time it's gonna look ugly i, I, I we, we can we can envision it i won't try to do real-time powerpointing on, on office hours but gonna a way to envision this is Let's envision maybe what I need to do for these office hours to build a whiteboard. That would be awesome. You need to think about that. Uh, let's envision the classic MDM use case. Three sources of data. One, two, three. And if I was drawing a PowerPoint, it, it would be, you know, you know, database one, database two, database three. Then you put something over top of it. That's the MDM, right? So the MDM is sitting above these three sources of data. Now let's draw some arrows. And arrows go up from the source systems into the MDM. If the arrows go one way into the MDM, that's an analytical MDM. If they go two ways, that's an operational MDM. <laughs> I've gone really simple here, but, but but that's it, right? Now, of course, if you're doing analytics, MDM platforms are not built as analytical platforms. Chances are from the ad MDM hub that's sitting above, you're going to take data, you're going to take your master IDs, and you're going to push those into BI layers. You're going to push them into your data warehouse, or your data lake for consumption by burst or click or Tableau or business objects or Synapse, whatever. Um, so there are other kind of things at play here, but analytical MDM is where data goes into the hub, but it doesn't go back down into the source systems. So analytical MDM will allow you to solve for things like a 360 view of something, right? So you have, Acme, Acme Incorporated, Acme Co, Acme LLC. You say, well, is that one thing or is that four things? I don't know. They've got separate IDs in each of those three systems, three source systems. They've got separate IDs. They have some commonalities, maybe around names some commonalities, maybe around uh, address and a few other attributes, but you're not entirely sure if that's one thing or three things. So they've got three source IDs. So as far as you know, those are three separate things. You pull them into, the, into an MDM, you apply some business rules to that data, like that consistent definition that I've been talking about and consistent hierarchy, consistent quality standards to it. You run some algorithms that, that are inherent to most all MDMs, including Prophecy, that will allow you with certain confidence to say, aha, this is one thing. Source ID one, source ID two, source ID three. Then what you do is you create a new master ID that links to all those source IDs. It's so basically what you're creating is a giant lookup table in essence. Right, where you have some new master ID now that links all those three things together. 
right? So you've got the master ID and you've got the relationship to the source IDs and the master ID. Then you can take that data and use it in your analytics platforms to link all of the transactional data for those three source IDs together. Because you know that this is one thing. So you have transactional data for all of those three source IDs, whatever the transactional data is, it doesn't matter. Clicks, customer sat data, it doesn't matter. But from an analytical perspective, you will now be able to link it all together to create that 360 of something, customer, location, product, whatever, right? Uh, that's an analytical MDM. You're not changing the source data, right? You're not merging records. You're not pushing that master ID or the master record back into source systems. All you're trying to do is answer questions like how many customers do we have? How many products do we have? How many locations do we have? Awesome way to start an MDM program. A great starting point because you can drive a lot of value from that. Like you could be a complete rock star in your organization if you answer the question of how many customers do we really have, honestly and truly and more accurately for the first time. Now, the catch with an analytical MDM is that you're not fixing source data. You're, 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 you're basically taking the source data as is. You can try, you can try to clean some of it up before you get to the point of linking everything together. Um, what I find though, is those data cleanups take a long time. They're really, really expensive. Uh, for a lot of companies, uh, what they find is, is that, is that they say, okay, well, we need to clean up this data first. It's like, oh man. And I've been, I've been, I've worked with a lot of those companies when I was a consultant and one of that previous lives. And you ask the question of like, well, why? And they'll say, okay, well, cause dirty data is bad. Okay, I, I get it. But what are your desired outcomes here? Well, we want a single view of the customer. Okay, well, how are you going to use that? Well, we're going to use that to drive cross sales and upsells. Aha. Aha. That's great. You've got an outcome in mind. Cross selling. You've got customers that are traversing multiple business silos, Acme, Acme Inc, Acme Co, and you don't know they're the same thing, the same customer or you don't know that there's relationships between two corporate entities and you're trying to identify opportunities to sell across those lines of business. To do that, you need a holistic view of the customer. Okay, that's good, great starting point. Do I need to clean up? Well, what are your, what are your goals, Chief Revenue Officer? What does success look like if you were able to do more cross-selling? Well, I have a goal of 20% incremental cross-sales next year. Okay. That's, that's great. Do I need to have 100% data quality to drive 20% incremental cross sales? Probably not. Do I need 90%? Probably not, right? So you get my point here, guys, which is you can build an analytical MDM. Be very, very careful about saying, aha, I need to clean up all my data first. Because first things, there's never, ever going to be perfect. Never. You, you, you will never get to 100%. You can try, but the costs are exponential. The costs to do that start to, I'm Canadian, so I like hockey metaphors, they start to hockey stick up. The cost to drive those data cleanups get very, 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 very expensive and the benefit declines significantly as the costs go up. So what's the sweet spot? I don't know, but I do know that if you ask your chief revenue officer, if the goal is cross sales or increased customer satisfaction, right? Talk to those people in marketing or in sales or, or wherever in the organization and say, well, what does success look like and how do you measure it? Well, I need, I need increase by 20%. Fantastic. Chances are I'd be willing to bet you could do that without even doing any data cleanup, at least in step one, right? So that's, the, that's kind of the beauty of analytical MDM is honestly, when I figured this out, it was like, wait a minute, I can drive business value and be a rock star without fixing any of my data, right? I can, I can allow the chief revenue officer to hit his or her goal next year without getting into a two-year-long data cleanup effort. Sign me up. Like, uh, that's the beauty of an analytical MDM is you don't have to get it in, enmeshed into fixing stuff, fixing broken business processes. Yes, we ultimately want to fix bro broken business processes. There's a reason why there are four versions of Acme when there probably should be one. But can you still drive value? I would say yes, you can. So analytical, easy to do, quicker to do. By the way, if you're talking to MDM vendors and they say, oh, we can be up and running in you know six to eight weeks they're talking about an analytical MDM. They're not talking about an operational MDM. Operational MDM is a lot more disruptive because what you're talking about generally is merging records. That's a destructive act, right? That will have impacts on business processes, right? Because one of those source records, if you take them or if you have three and you make one, well, then what happens to historical reporting for those other two records that no longer exist, right? 
There are answers to those questions. We're not going to get into them today, but operational MDM is a, will generally take a lot longer, is generally is a little bit more disruptive, can drive incredible value for an organization. Uh, but that's when you get into months and months and months of a deployment instead of weeks. So love the question. Th thanks for asking it. Um, simple. Karen, thank you. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. That's what I try to do. That's what I try to do. All right. Looking back to the chat. Um, oh, wait. Oh, we got another question. Thank you, Haley, if that's you. Awesome. Good ebook or online resources for MDM. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's prophecy.com. Great place to start. So all the things that I'm talking about now, um, talking about, you know, styles of MDM implementation styles, talking about governance, uh, talking about data strategy. I just published something the other day, uh, prophecy.com. We've got a lot of stuff out there. Uh, we had for a while, two Gartner analysts, me and Bill O'Kane, Bill recently re retired. Um, but what we've been doing slowly but surely over the last couple of years is replicating all the things that we knew at Gartner and all the best practices that we were sharing at Gartner. Uh, and we've been and we've been publishing that to our website. So go check out the resources area uh, on, on prophecy.com. Uh, there are other sources of information out there. Thank you. MDM resources flashing on the bottom of the screen. Uh, there are other resources as well. Uh, I don't need to just promote myself, but uh, I do do a podcast, CDO Matters. That's that, that's pretty fun, pretty high level. Lots of stuff out on uh, prophecy.com. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm pushing a lot of stuff out on LinkedIn, a lot of content out on LinkedIn, uh, whether that is white papers, blogs, just video snippets, you name it. Uh, beyond prophecy and what I do for a living and, and, and you know how we can help, there are a lot of resources out there. I am a fan of Gartner, although it is very, very expensive and for a lot of companies, they, they can't afford it, but they do 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 do. They do a great job from the best practices perspective. I had mentioned uh, Dama. Uh, so, so, so Dama is kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a standards body because it's not, uh, but, but they do a lot of good work in helping, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of an accreditation, accredita a professional accreditation, 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 not tation. English is my first language, guys, trust me. Uh, uh, they do some professional accreditations. Um, and they've got a lot of very, very, very <coughs> valuable content out there. Another is Dataversity. Um, I don't know if they're .com or .net. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Uh, Dataversity's got a whole bunch of resources related to data quality, data governance, MDM. They do also a really good um, uh, do a really good job. Uh, the EDM Enterprise Data Management Council is 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 another one uh, where they've got uh, a certain amount of content out there. Another is the Data Management University (DMU) uh, Data Management University. So, like, there's I just rattled off like four or five. Where if you went into any one of those websites, Dataversity, Data Management Universe, uh, Data Management U, uh, Dama, 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 uh, like you could spend there's there's weeks of of insight out there. To, to consume. So prophecy.com, we're here to help. I'm here. I do this once a month. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Please hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help there too. But outside of prophecy, there is there's there's resources galore here. The, the hardest part is is not being able to find the information, but the hardest part is really to kind of operationalizing the information and and making the jump from theory to practice. And that's that's where somebody like me can come in because I've 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 done this, right? And I've I've learned the hard way <laughs> and there's a lot of people out there. I, I, I value them. I value their input. I value, uh, their perspectives and what they're trying to do, meaning help people and help companies. But a lot of them have never done this, right? They've, they've, ne they've never put a shovel in the ground. They've never got their, their, their hands dirty. Uh, but I have for better or worse. Yeah. That's, that's the gray hair. Um, oh, Thanks, Haley. Yes, putting in my LinkedIn, you know, the uh, the, the, uh, the the hit me up on LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, more questions? I'm clicking. Wow, are we out of questions? There are a few folks that haven't actually asked questions. Uh, Scott? Glad you can make it, but if you do want to ask a question, we are down to our last few minutes here. 
I will take a sip of coffee. Oh, Garanga, the uh, Microsoft uh, Ignite summary. Yes, it'll be published. At, so uh, I did it as a podcast, and we're going to put something out next week. Sorry, I need uh, need some coffee to keep my voice uh, lubricated here. Uh, it, it was fun, um, but weird. <laughs> fun and weird. Um, Microsoft is, is, is a strategic partner of ours. We, we, we have a fantastic working relationship with Microsoft, but my conference experience was, 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 was odd. Um, uh, the podcast will be titled our in-person conferences dead. That's the kind of the question, the provocative question that I, that I answer or that I ask, uh, short answer. No, they're not dead. They're most certainly not dead. Uh, there were a lot of people attending Microsoft's event. There were 200,000 people attending kind of globally online, and there were 3,500 people in Seattle. Uh, I was one of them a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, clearly, they were trying to do some sort of hybrid type thing where it was, you know, online and in, uh, on, in person. But the in person was, it seemed like it was the lowest on the priority list. It was just, it was just weird. Um, where so much of the content was online and so much of the focus was go online and so much of the focus was, you know, go chat online. And that in-person uh, experience just seemed to sacrifice as, an, as a result. Um, so I would welcome you to check out that podcast next week, probably Wednesday, Thursday is when it will publish. Garanga, you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll know, uh, and I'll put a link up on LinkedIn uh, where I go into more details, including some of the you know, like interesting stuff like food and snacks and uh, other mundane stuff about a con conference experience. So uh, I think that, well, that will not actually be my last conference of the year. Uh, so for anybody there who is watching this on YouTube, and yes, we publish all these to YouTube. That, that's why I'm, I'm not having a lot of dead air here. Uh, but it is, you know, currently almost early November. It's amazing. Halloween next week. Uh, the first week of December, I think it's the 6th, 7th, 8th. Um, so barely first week, uh, uh, data diversity that I was mentioning, fantastic enterprise provides a lot of value and a lot of insight, um, in terms of content, they do two conferences a year. They call them the data governance and information quality, uh, event. Uh, the next one is happening in DC, the national Harbor in DC. It's the, the big JW Marriott. It's not down on the Harbor. I think it's the JW Marriott up, up, uh, uh north of Georgetown. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, they're holding their big event in December. I'll be speaking there uh, at that event. I'll be speaking on blockchain, which is a favorite topic of mine, by the way. If you've got any questions about blockchain and crypto, that's that's it's a whole other world that I live in. I wrote an article recently that was uh, published in Forbes about my theory of how data governance will be saved by blockchain. Um, it's got some interesting responses there. Um, Time is flying. Spooky. Yes, it's Halloween, uh, Haley. I guess so. It's it's, it's fitting. Uh, but anyway, conference, Data Governance Information Quality Conference. It's a great conference. I attended in June in San Diego. Uh, if you want to go to learn about governance, to learn about MDM, data quality, what other people are doing, if, if, if you are responsible for implementing and managing a data governance, MDM, data quality program, that's the conference for you. Uh, DGIQ. It is it is very, very focused on people who do this stuff for a living. It's not really focused on CIOs and CDOs and senior level executives. It's, it's focused on the people who have been tasked to solve for these things. So if you want to go have conversations with people like me who've done it, who've been there, who've worked at companies like yours in, in verticals like yours, DGIQ, I, I would absolutely recommend attending that conference. It's a really, really good one. Uh, DC, I, I lived there for a decade. Uh, so I know it really, really well. Um, DC in early December is, uh, it, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird time to be, to be visiting DC because by that time everything is turned brown, but it's not cold yet. So there's no snow, but it's kind of brown. Uh, but still, DC is worth a visit if you've never been. Oh my gosh, DC is a great place to visit. So many monuments, uh, so much to see. Um, uh, I'm a recent American citizen. I just became a citizen a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Canadian. But I'm also American now, but but it was kind of neat to go to D.C. and to experience the monuments. Oddly, I lived there for a decade and I never went to go visit any of the monuments. After I left is when I went to go visit all the monuments. And it's it's certainly well worth the trick, the trip. Oh, that's cool. 
Tarzan, uh, does that mean you went to DC or you became a US citizen like me? I, I, I don't know. All, all good. But yeah, DC is worth the trip and, and there's going to be a conference there in the fall. Um, making sure that I've tied off on all of the questions. To see our core group of folks. All right. We're getting towards the top of the hour. If there's no more questions, I am happy to tie it off there. Give it just a couple of more minutes. Thanks, Garaga. All right. I think that is a great place to end. Happy Halloween for anybody that actually does that. Uh, I know it's a very much a kind of a North American, well, it's not entirely a North American phenomenon, but I, I think we get into it a little bit more than other parts of the world. So happy Halloween to everybody. Enjoy the 31st. Be safe. Uh, have a great weekend. It's Friday. Woohoo! Thanks all. And we will see you again in another month. Please tell the people that you work with, tell the folks in your organization, tell anybody else that you're out there talking to, if, if they're struggling with MDM governance, if they need some help from a Gartner analyst, um, come Friday, 11 o'clock, uh, last Friday of the month, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here in the US. Would love to see them. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off.